chapter 38. I seem like I come, my mind is somewhere else today. It shouldn't be, but... <clears throat> And this, this lesson, uh, I don't think there's any verse in this entire chapter, and probably not in the next, next one either, that's going to be simple uh, when the Lord's talking. And it's like this, you know, it's like the guy that says he didn't believe in Noah's ark. He says there's no way he got all those animals in that ark. And the question comes up, well, how many animals were there? And the guy goes, well, I don't know. Well, how big was the ark? I don't know. Ignorance is a poor. <laughs> I mean, to criticize the Bible that, or to say something like that, and that's like Job. He's, he's saying some things, and now God's saying, well, how big is the universe? And, or how's this and how's that? How do you know that? Well, I don't know that. Then why, well, then why are you accusing me when you don't know the things that I know? And um, we, we continue with verse 25 is where we left off. And he said, we're going to read from verse 25 to 27. It says, Who hath divided a water course for the overflowing of waters, or a way for the lightning of thunder, to cause it to rain on the earth where no man is, on the wilderness wherein there is no man, to satisfy the desolate and waste ground, and to cause the bud of the tender herb to spring forth? Now what I'm finding with these verses, and, uh, and studying Dr. Ruckman pretty close, <laughs> is that there are multiple applications. I may have added an application here or there, but there are applic different applications of this. Um, just like in heaven, there, there seems to be representations of everything down here that's up there or up there is down here. Uh, he talks about the pattern of the tabernacle, and there's uh, you know, a tabernacle in heaven or at least a place or a temple where God is. Uh, there is um, pictures up there. There's a Jerusalem up there. There's a Jerusalem down here. And we're going to find that this really all the way down through the uh, universe, it's kind of true down to earth, we can see that it can apply up here, or it can apply down here. You can make application. So the applications are numerous. If I was going to make an application of this in nature, uh, the first verse, who hath divided a water course? Um, God calls his water courses to be divided uh, all the time in tributaries. It happens through local flooding. Uh, it happens through earthquakes. Earthquakes can actually change the direction of a river. Uh, also, um, volcanoes can change a landscape and can change uh, water courses, water flows. So he talks about dividing it. Well, he does it all the time here on this earth. Um, notice it doesn't say what divided. That's what science wants to know. Well, what caused this? But no, it's, always, it's in the Bible. It's who who hath divided a water course for the overflowing of waters or a way for the lightning of thunder? So he's talking about an overflowing of waters. He's talking about a, a water course. That's just a course of water. This could apply to Noah's flood. I mean, somehow he changed a water course and opened up the windows of heaven and directed water from heaven down to earth. Um. That's in Genesis 7, 11. It says, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the seventh day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven are open. Now, I've erred in, in uh, discerning this verse. I, I looked it over again today, and I thought, you know, I, I really can't say that. I must have heard it from somebody else. You know, you, sometimes you've got to be careful. You hear somebody else teach something, and then you buy into it without really ever checking. And um, I've, always, I've always thought, and I think I've always taught, that there was water underneath that came up. It does not appear so. It appears that this is the fountains. Of, that water did come up from the ground. It does say that. But to say that that was part of the flood waters might be going a little bit too far. Uh, it doesn't say that in the text. It says the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were open. Now, how God got all that water from what? The great deep that is millions of light years away, how he got it down to earth? Well, the same way he got starlight to you. You know, they say, well, yeah, by the time you see a star, it's already burned out. Well, <laughs> what if God created the stars and said, okay, light be here right now? What if you're actually looking at them in real time? 
Wouldn't that blow your mind? I mean, what good would it be for God to put stars out there and then you couldn't see them? I mean, if they're that far away, I don't know. I mean, unless you'd have to come up with, well, that's probably where they're dating the universe. It's got to be like 2.5 billion years. Why? Because we're seeing all this starlight, you know. I don't know how they date it. But God can bring that light to you immediately. He doesn't have to wait. If he can create the light, he can bring it. Okay. Anyway, um, so when he says there, who hath divided a water course for the overflowing of waters? Well, Noah's flood, would, would, you could add it as part of the, uh, an application of that verse. But cosmically, if I say that right, cosmically, you can also, uh, it fits even better. In Genesis 1, 2, and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. There are some waters there. And notice it says that, um, that he moved upon the face of the deep. We know that we know what this is. We, we call this the deluge or uh, I don't know. It's, it's a destruction that happened. It's not Noah's flood. It's a destruction that happened to the earth uh, before he started the recreation in Genesis 1-3. Now, I know people that don't, don't agree with that. I won't kick anybody out of the church for not believing that. You, have, you can believe what you want on that. As far as that goes, you can believe what you want. But you're going to have a hard time explaining the fall of Lucifer and a third of the angels that, that, that have fallen and exactly when that happened. And you're going to have it happening in a tree in the garden, the fall. He's already fallen. He's the serpent. Okay? It's happened before that. So, um, so when he says there, who hath divided a water course for the overflowing of waters? Well, isn't that what we find in 2 Peter 3, 6? Go ahead and turn there. Now, I, I know that I've been through all this with you when it comes to the, um, what we call the gap. I don't call it the gap theory anymore because I don't believe it's a theory. I believe it's true. In 2 Peter 3, 6, he says, Whereby the world that then was. Now, if you read the context, he says, uh, it, it's, it's, it's not the same world because he talks about the world that is now. In Noah's flood, the world wasn't destroyed. It was just covered in water. This thing was destroyed. It was literally the whole planet was underwater. It perished. It was without form and void. I don't think the, our planet was without form and void when in Noah's flood, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Okay? And he says, he tells you there in 2 Peter chapter 3, he says the world, is, the people are ignorant of this thing. Why? That God's already once destroyed it and that he'll destroy it again. Once, he's already done it, destroyed it by water. Now he's destroyed man from off the face of the earth by water and even the animals. But he didn't destroy the planet itself. Man, he sunk this thing under the water. Because that's exactly what you find in Genesis 1-2. God moved upon the face of the water. Why? Because the earth was under the water. Then he divided the waters. That's exactly how you go right down through there. You can see them. And this is not the steps of creation. This is, this is recovering what he's destroyed and remaking it. And then putting man on there. And this is that thing where started with the angels. And he said, you know what? I'm going to identify with my creation. So Jesus Christ is the angel of the Lord, a theophany, an appearance of God. And then he creates this little, it creates the earth for these angels. He tells them, go down there and dwell. There's a cherubim he puts down there in charge of things. And all of a sudden he hears the heart of that cherubim rebelling against him. And there's a group of those angels that are with him. So he scraps that whole thing and moves right on down the line. And, it's, and see, that, that angel no longer is an heir of God. They are ministers of those which shall be heirs of salvation. They're going to minister to men. He turned that thing over to man, and now Jesus Christ is born in a manger in Jerusalem. He became a man. This thing, this thing went from the angels had their shot and blew it. 
man got his shot. The only thing is, God did something different this time. He left man just a little ignorant. If, I think if we'd have been like the angels and being in the presence of God, it would have made a different matter. And the fact that nobody came and deceived Lucifer. He deceived himself. Whereas Lucifer shows up in the garden to deceive Adam. That might have been the only redeeming thing. Believe it or not, God had this, had this, understood this plan well before it ever, this thing ever fell out of what he was going to do. It didn't take him by surprise, and he had a plan. Anyway, I would have got into all that. But, um, but he talks about these fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows have... I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong one. Genesis 1-2. And the earth without form and void, darkness upon the face of the deep. And then 2 Peter 3, 6, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Now turn to Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 10 to 12. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 10 to 12. Let's see if you can find that, that verse or that book. It's a tough one. Everybody there? That's good. The mountains saw thee, and they trembled. The overflowing of water passed by. Always saw, remember 2 Peter 3, 6, overflowed with water. Here at Habakkuk chapter 3, the overflowing of water passed by. The deep uttered his voice and lifted up his hands on high. The sun and the moon stood still in their habitation. The light of thine arrows, they went. I think it's a reference to lightning. And the shining of thy glittering spear. Thou, thou didst march through the land in indignation. Thou didst thresh the heathen in anger. I'll tell you what, now this is the second advent. And this is where he's coming through that great deep. Uh, and notice he says the sun and the moon stood still in their habitation. So what he did back there in Joshua when the sun, he's going to do again at the advent. The sun's not going to set until he's, he's completed what he's going to do. Everything, he's just going to freeze everything in place, and here he comes. But he's got to come through that great deep to get here. He's able to divide and make a course, uh, uh, divide a water course, or he divided a water course. And you have the overflowing waters. There's, um, this can also apply, look at Jeremiah chapter 47. This can also apply to an invading army. Sometimes the Lord, I, I realize what it looks like, but it's application. What he's telling Job, you know, an individual could, could read that and say, well, is that true in nature? Is that, is that scientifically, scientifically accurate? Well, it is. Uh, we'll find out that, um, that um, lightning and thunder can actually cause rain. It's actually, actually helpful in making rain. But there's also other applications that could fit it that if you're in tune with the scriptures, you just tie one thing to another because you can see it. Everything, everything in Job is going to have some connection with the tribulation because it's about that time period. So he says there in Jeremiah 47, 2, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, waters rise up out of the north. Now context, if you want to read it, it's going to be Nebuchadnezzar coming with his armies. It says, uh, Behold, waters rise up out of the north, and shall be an overflowing flood, and shall overflow the land, and all that is therein, the city and them that dwell therein. Then the men shall cry, and all the inhabitants of the land shall howl. And he's talking about an army coming in. Well, isn't the Lord coming back with an invading army? I mean, not only do you have an invading army coming up against Jerusalem, against the Holy Land, but that's an invading army. That's the Antichrist army, but then you got the Lord coming back from heaven. Anyway, um, he talks about the, it's uh, an overflowing flood, and that'd be an overflowing flood of soldiers. Then there's another, another reference. Look at Psalm 69. Psalms chapter 69. Verse 14, 15, Psalm 69 is, is heavily about, uh, has heavy application to Jesus Christ. And it says in verse 14, Deliver me out of the mire, and let me not sink. Let me be delivered from them that hate me, and out of the deep waters. 
Let not the water flood overflow me, neither let the deep swallow me up, and let not the pit shut her mouth upon me. And I, if that's in reference to Jesus Christ and, and his plea with the Father that he not be overcome or, or um, he's given the promise that if he'll go to the cross, he'll have, he'll have eternal life as a man. In fact, that's, uh, is that Titus 1? In hope of eternal life, which God cannot lie, promised before the world began. Whatever that verse is, that's not to you. That's to him. So he has the promise that he'll come up. He has the promise that once he's down in the heart of the earth or in the depths of, 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 of this world or the center of the earth, wherever you want to call it, he has the power to come up. He's got the power that if he'll do this as a man, God will grant him eternal life. Let me give you that verse. Some of you are looking at me like that's a new doctrine or something. Hey, what is it? Titus 1, yeah, that's what I was thinking. 1 verse 2. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. It's not, it's not made to you as a promise. Who he had promised to had to be here before the world began. He promised him. That he was going to be able to come up. So it can be a reference. This could be a reference to hell. And here's what I was talking about. You say, could it apply to the great deeps? Yep. You know why? Because the deeps are under God's feet. When you think of the word deep, you mean of something down there. <laughs> something below you. The deeps. Okay? You don't think of the deeps up here, but what if you're God? Deeps are under His feet. The great deeps, all right. Well, there's some deeps under our feet. we got a deep blue sea. Okay? We've got the core of the earth. We've got a deep Something that goes down very deep. So the application can be twofold. And that's what the, that's what the reference over there in, uh, um, or in Psalm 69. Because he's mentioning there, let the deep swallow me not, let not the pit shut her mouth upon me. Well, that pit's in the earth. Now, when he mentions there the lightning and thunder, I, t I mentioned this. Um, that doesn't just have to be in our atmosphere, but let me give you, let me tell you this. Lightning and thunder helps in causing rainfall by breaking up cloud formations by the explosions of hydrogen and oxygen. So they, they, they actually help the clouds to, to burst with rainfall. So the verse is, is, of course, accurate. If God spoke it, it's accurate. It's 100% accurate. But it's not the only place where you find thunderings and lightnings. Look in uh, Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. And out of the throne proceedeth proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And we just talked about that context. That's the, the frozen deep, which we're going to get into tonight. In the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. But notice there, there's lightnings and thunderings up there before the throne of God. And there's thunderings and lightnings here. It's amazing how many things apply, not only up there, but down here. Um, and it could have both applications, is what I'm saying. You could apply it to both. Many times in your Bible, that's what you're reading. You're reading, I mean, you're reading something. You've got to be careful what you're, how you read it. Because if I said Mount Zion, you'd say, well, which one? Or you should say which one. There are two. There's a Mount Zion on this earth, but there's a Mount Zion up there too. And your context can sometimes tell you what the difference uh, of which one it is. When the one talks about the, the Mount Zion in the sides of the north, the city of the great king, well, we know that one's up there. Verse 26 and verse 27. 
And this brings it, remember, the question is not what. Science always wants to concentrate on the what by ignoring the who. <laughs> and to their own damnation, by the way, because the Bible says they're ever learning but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. And that says you can read scientific journals and scientific things till you're blue in the face. And you will gain knowledge, you, impressive knowledge, you know. You know why a balloon rises, you know, and a brick falls. Bless your heart. But you don't know who set all that in motion. The who is what you don't know, and the who is what you've got to know. You can be ignorant as a stump, but if you know who, you're one of the wisest men in the room. Because you don't have to know all the what's if you know who. And he says there, who hath divided water course? All right, look at verse 26 and 27. To cause it to rain on the earth. Again, it's the who. To cause it to rain on the earth where no man is. On the wilderness wherein there is no man. To satisfy the desolate and waste ground and to cause the bud of the tender herb to spring forth. Okay, if a tree falls in the woods and there's no one there to hear it, does it make a sound? Yes, because it wasn't there for you to hear it in the first place. It was for God. Because He's taking care of the waste places. He's taking care of His creation, whether there's a man there or not. I mean, you think you've got duties to do every day. I think I get up, you know, and feed the dog, feed the chickens, you know, and go check on the chicks and do this and do that. I think, man, I'm, Lord, I really took care of this farm today. He said, well, you didn't take care of uh, this waste place over here I took care of. Right down to the amoebas and protozoas. I fed this, this group over here, and, and I fed this field over here with nutrients and rain. I mean, God's taking care of all of it. Problem is, why is he doing it when there's no man there? I mean, why do it? If there's not a man there, why would God do that? Huh. And you really, that's a very selfish question. You do realize that, right? We'll get to it in a second. There's a numerable amount of plants and animals, some still undiscovered, that God feeds, waters, and nourishes every day. I mean, stuff they haven't even found yet. I mean, it's still out there. Every now and then, they'll come across, we found a new species, like they invented it. I'm like, that's because you weren't looking hard enough. There's probably a lot more. I mean, some of the stuff they say is extinct. You know, somebody runs over one with a car, or they find another one. Like, it's not extinct. I don't know. There might even be a dodo bird out there. I am certain there's a dodo bird. Anyway. Huh? They walk on two feet. <laughs> Sun rises and sunsets from places where no man has been. God sees all of them. You ever thought of that? I mean, you know, I, I've missed, I've seen many a sunset. I've, I've missed many a sunrise because I can't see it from my house, but I can see the sunset. And I can tell you this, man, God's seen it from, I don't care from where on earth you're at, God has seen every sunset. And you just assume God doesn't care. Well, He created it. Galaxies that no man has ever seen, that are out of our view, God sees them every second. He sees the magnificence of them even in a fallen state. Now, granted, he's not putting any more energy into this, what we call a closed system. He's not putting any more energy into it because it's, it's done. He's going to end up just wrapping the thing up and uh, uh, folding it up like a garment. And that's the end of it. But you've got to admit, man, if this is how it is now, can you imagine how it was on creation day? Can you imagine how at the end of those six days and rest on the seventh and... Before the fall, all the power of God was in this universe. I mean, God was empowering the thing, man. You know, when you, when you ha as long as you put power into something, it keeps going. I mean, it's, there's, no evol there's no devolution. Okay? It's just, it just stays powered. So it's like your car, as long as you keep gas, your car runs, but don't put any gas in, guess what happens? It's going to be sitting on the side of the road somewhere. Well, God's kept putting in, as long as he's putting energy into this thing, I imagine, it was, I imagine that every world was complete. I have no reason to doubt it. He said he made the stars also. And he made them, every one of them, he made different. They're different in size, different in shape. I mean, they're, 
all kinds of things were different about them. I'm sure the plants were different, if there were some. Now, maybe he didn't go to all, maybe he didn't dress them out right away. Maybe he didn't do that. But he sure did make it beautiful. And you got to admit that, man. You look up into the heavens and see the stars above your head and the Milky Way and all that stuff, and you just look at those stars, it's amazing. On a clear day, you're just overwhelmed. And that's a fallen universe. I can't imagine what the new one's going to be like. It's going to be incredible. But the thing is, we assume that all that was for us, and if we can't see it, it's not there. But that's the wrong thought. It wasn't for you in the first place. It was for him. He says there in Colossians 1.16, For by him were all things created, that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and what? For who? Was that you? For, was that me? For him. So when we think, you know, well, you know, this is all for us. No, it wasn't. Not originally it wasn't. It was for him. That's why he created it. Uh, our, our verse that we love here in our church, Revelation 4.11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. You know what the kicker is to all this? God said it, it because I created it for me and for my pleasure, and then he declares to the Christian, all things are yours. Turns around and gives it to us. If I, in other words, as long as long as we're, as long as we're saved, as long as we're part of God's family, He says, "I'm just going to give it to you." I mean, He still gets pleasure out. Of, he gets pleasure out of us, but all of a sudden we get to experience it. But he's taking care of things, whether we're there or not. If you imagine, and I realize God allows certain things to happen, but usually the species that are extinct didn't die out because of God. A lot of them died out because of us. Now, don't get all weepy on me here, okay? I don't care nothing about a spotted owl. A little ketchup, a little hot sauce. You say, why? Because if God's going to destroy the heaven and the earth. Okay? I mean, he's literally just going to take it down. So whatever he's created, if he wants to create again, he can. God didn't lose the blueprint to create anything. And yes, manage your environment. Quit throwing junk out the windows of your car. That, that probably, if there's anything that caused me to ram somebody else's car, I've seen them throw garbage out of their car. Absolutely. To see that, it just, it just shows a nation that no longer cares. And just throw garbage out of their car. You go along the side of the road, you can't hardly go down a highway without just seeing nothing but tons of litter. I'm like, who throws out all this garbage? I mean, you don't have to, you can manage your environment where you don't have to poison it. You don't have to trash it up. You'd be a good steward of the land without having to make every law in the world keeping you from doing what you want to do. In other words, we'll get there. We'll get there without the EPA. Just people, just they're careless. They don't care what they do to their environment. You know. Anyway, Lord, take care of that. I'm not so concerned. I'm concerned about a soul of a man. Not the not the the sea or the sky or whatever you know. And you say, oh, you would, because you know what? If I worried about those things, if God ain't worried about, it, why am I worried about it? God didn't even tell me to worry about that. Why? Because I got that handled. I'm the creator. As a matter of fact, when we glorify those things, when we become environmental warriors, just read the book of Revelation. You'll change your mind about that. God purposely decimates the earth, the sky. He pours smoke into it. He turns the water to blood. He turns the animals against you. I mean, he just, he decimates it. Why? Because he says, that's not me. And if they, we just turn to him, he'd give us the answers to everything. He is the answer to everything. 
Anyway, so don't get caught up in that. And I'll tell you what, I know a lot of people, they care more, they care more about their pets than they do the souls of men. And that's a shame. I mean, you love your dog, but man, when, you know, when your dog takes precedence over a human being that's, got, that's eternal, I don't know, man, there's something wrong there. Anyway, verse 26 and 27 can also apply to Israel's restoration. Uh, he says there in Isaiah 43, 19, Behold, I will do a new thing. Uh, now it shall spring forth, and uh, shall you not know it? All right. Behold, I do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Well, there's a water course. Isaiah 51, 3 says, For the Lord shall comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places. We talked about the desert and the waste places. And he will make her wilderness like Eden. Okay, this is not, you know, um, pumping water through irrigation ditches and stuff like that. You know, they say, oh, look what Israel done. They, they caused the desert. And we're talking about the Arabian desert to bloom. We're talking about Saudi Arabia to bloom. Like a, like a flower, like a, like, a, like a garden. It says, The wilderness like Eden, the desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness shall be found there, and thanksgiving and the voice of melody. I mean, that's when he comes back. And he's able to do all that. Don't, so he's going, to have to, he's going to have to divide some waterways to do that. All right, verse 28. Hath the rain a father? Or who hath begotten the drops of dew? Again, it's not about what. <laughs> it's about who. And man can figure out the what on this, you know. They, they figure it out, you know, where rain comes from and how it happens, you know, and evaporation, condensation, all that good stuff. But you know what? They still don't know the, the who. And, and they're not as smart as you think they are. They don't have a handle on energy, electrical or nuclear. They don't know what it is. They, they, they can harness it. They can put it through wires. They can cause it to explode. I, I always worried about that. You know, it's like somebody got a, a, a science uh, project or science kit messing around, you know. I got one of those one time. I don't know how I didn't kill myself with it. I think they had uh, potassium permanganate in there. Man, that's some, that's some wicked stuff, man. You mix that with a little um, um, glycerin, and man, it'll, it'll generate some, it'll start a fire. So I, I remember all that stuff. I don't know why. I guess back then they figured, well, you know, kids are expendable. Um, you know, my parents figured, we got three. If one goes by the way, well. Um, but man figured out the what, but not the who. And they don't know what, they don't know anything about, they know what gravity does. They don't know what it is. Or magnetism. I just... They can't, they can only go so far with it because it boils down to a who, <laughs> not a what. <laughs> God put these things in place. They're, 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 they're laws that God put in place. So the Bible says they're ever learning, but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. They're, they're ever learning about what it does, just not who brought it about in the first place. Uh, 1 Corinthians, look at 1 Corinthians 3, verse 19 and 20. First Corinthians 3, verse 19 and 20. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. Why? Because they're chasing their tail. They are ever learning, and they they and they're ever expanding their base of knowledge, they just never come to a conclusion. You know, that's what science is. It just, it just goes on forever. Whereas if you know who, if you know who did it, then it kind of, there's the end of the matter. How he did it, I don't know. But I know who did it. And he says he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. You know what he does? He just keeps generating questions. And they just keep they see this, and they see that, and they see this connects with this, and they just keep going. But they never, ever, ever see that there's a designer that designed it all. He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. He just keeps them chasing their tail. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are vain. They think it happened by accident. 
There's no other, there, there, listen, there is no other explanation. If there is not a God, this, all of this, happened by an accident. I've been in accidents. And nothing good came of it, except twisted metal, you know, blood and guts. Have you had accidents? Do your accidents turn out like this? Have you ever had an accident that turned out good? Where something didn't get destroyed? It didn't happen by accident. It happened by design. And anyone with any common sense in any field would see that and know that. It's a disdain for God that they don't want to know Him because it puts them under conviction because of their sin. That is why. Okay, he mentions there, hath the Father rain, or hath, or who hath begotten the drops of dew? Now there, you know, they, you know, there's always somebody come along and say, well, you know, the dew drops down. The Bible says the dew drops down from heaven, but the dew is formed at the ground. Well, that's one form of dew, but there are three, four if you count Mountain Dew. <laughs> there are three types of dew. Two of them form in the atmosphere, and one form. Or, Two of them form droplets in the atmosphere, and one forms on the ground. Now, dew just means drops of condensed vapor. So, I'll give you three verses for, three, for the three different types. Clouds can drop down dew. Proverbs 3.10, By his knowledge the depths are broken up, and the clouds drop down the dew. There's one. It's clouds can create dew. Fog can create dew. You say, well, fog is just a falling cloud. Yeah, but still it's fog. Okay. Psalm 133.3, it says, As the dew of Hermon, which is a mountain, as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. So, you know when, the, when you get fog and everything, you ever just walk through a thick fog and you can just feel the moisture clinging to you? Clinging to everything. Clinging to your windows, I mean your windows are, well, that's condensate, that's dew. But it's, a, it's, it's fog that can be, it's, uh, that's from dew. Then you have moisture that forms as droplets on plants. You experience that every morning when you step out there, it's just soaking wet. I'll tell you, without dew, listen, you could have, you could have a very bad uh, drought, but if you've got dew, your plants will last a lot longer. Man, you lose that dew. Your plants will be dead in a week. They need that dew every morning. It's amazing how it sustains things. He said in Isaiah 26, 19, Thy dead men shall live together with thy dead body. Shall they arise, awake, and sing, ye that dwell in the dust, or dwell in dust. For thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. I have no idea what that means in that verse, except for thy dew is as the dew of herbs. There's dew on the grass and on the herbs. No matter which type of dew, it comes from moisture in the atmosphere. Okay? It's where it, come, it comes from the heaven. Uh, Genesis 27, 28, Therefore God give thee the dew of heaven, and the fatness of the earth, and plenty of corn and wine. Now it's interesting, that, you know, Whenever, there's a couple things that uh, Dr. Ruckman brought up that God loves to throw science curveballs. Now, they always come up with a pat answer or some answer for it, but he has a way of just throwing them curveballs. Water is one of them. Because water doesn't behave like the other elements. In water, when you freeze it, well, if I, were to take, if I were to take lead and put it in a freezer, it will shrink. Metals shrink. Water, if you put it in the freezer, will what? Expand. Okay, and then if you put it under heat, what will it do? It'll contract. It does just the opposite of what the other elements do. Now, they've got their reason why. But it's just amazing how differently water reacts than the other elements. It's a curveball. Um, if I understand right, Venus turns the wrong way. It turns clockwise. The Earth is counterclockwise. But Venus clockwise. Why? I'm sure they came up with some answer or whatever, but God has a way of this. Because the designer can do what he wants. 
Jesus says, you know, I need to get out there in that boat. Now, how am I going to get out there? I can call it a taxi cab that's on the water. You know, I can yell at him as loud as I can, make him get him to come back and pick me up. Or I can just walk on out there and get on that boat. Why? Because I made the laws. I made the laws and I could super... If I want the sun to stand still, if I want the moon to stand still, I can do it. Why? I made the laws. Does anybody know why Venus rotates clockwise? Just thought I'd ask. I didn't, thought maybe somebody might know. Huh? God made, it. <laughs> God made it that way. That's right. God made it that way just to irritate some scientist. <laughs> but, you know, they'll, they'll be chasing their tail forever. And, and, and Seriously, somebody like that, it's a, it's a pride thing. They've never come to the knowledge of the truth, but yet you tap into their brain, they know all kinds of stuff. And I, and I give them kudos for, the, for, the, for being able to understand the math. But good grief, man, you never come to a conclusion with science. You just keep going on out, headed, you know, you're just headed out that way and you never come back. Um, it never really answers anything. It doesn't really do anything. We've not stopped anything. Everybody still get colds? We're still dying from disease? Have we brought anybody up from the dead? Can we travel to another earth? What has science actually done? I mean, you've got advances in transportation and communication. That's it. That's basically what they've done. We can get you, we can get you over there faster. And now you can talk to somebody and not even have to go over there. <laughs> communication and transportation is about the best that science can do. Not much more after that. Oh, we've learned how to kill each other more efficiently. Oh, yeah, we can do that. Big advancements in that. Okay. Verse 29 and 30. It says, out of, whose womb came the, or out of whose womb came the ice and the hoary frost of heaven, who hath gendered it? The waters are hid as with a stone and the face of the deep is frozen. We have definitely left the planet when we come to that last verse. But he says, notice it's not what or where or how. It says, whose womb? And then it says, who hath gendered it? I would think Job would go, you? <laughs> He'd probably be right. He'd be right. It says, he talks about the hoary frost of heaven. This is not what gets deposited on your windshield in December through March. This is something that's up there. It's above our heads. The context is the deep. It's frozen at the north like a sea of glass. Revelation 4, 6, I think we've already read this one time, and before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. Very important word there, crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. He's not talking about down here. I've met a beast with, uh, eye, full of eyes before and behind. <laughs> if I did, I'd be running from it. He's talking about up there. And he is talking about a sea of glass. He said, the waters are hid as with a stone. The face of the deep is frozen. And he says, it's frozen crystal. Water, it says, glass like a crystal. A place so cold that all molecular movement ceases at absolute zero. And that's what we call zero degree Kelvin. That's mi minus 460 degrees Fahrenheit. That's when... You've got something, a substance, there's no movement. I don't know if you know it or not, but anytime, anything above Kelvin, you've got movement inside there. You've, the atoms and the electrons flowing out on the outside of the, the nucleus and all, you've always got, there's no movement at all. Let me read you the third law of, of, of thermodynamics. It says the entropy of a perfect crystal is zero. Entropy, entropy is the loss of heat energy. It is the simplest form of energy, heat. And it is the loss of heat energy. Thus, they talk about randomness or they talk about disorder. Well, that's what happens in a system that has entropy. 
Your car is not getting better. It's falling apart from the time you took it off the lot. Uh, your house isn't getting better unless you put energy into it to make it better because entropy is set on that house. Entropy is set on these bodies. Okay? But so it's talking about, you know, when somebody says entropy, they're talking about the loss of heat energy. And it says the entropy of a perfect crystal is zero. When the temperature of the crystal is equal to absolute zero or zero degrees Kelvin. There's no loss of energy at all. It is perfectly stable at zero degrees Kelvin. According to, 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 bleh, according to Purdue University, the crystal must be perfect or else there will be some inherent disorder. It also must be at zero degrees Kelvin, otherwise there will be thermal motion within the crystal which leads to disorder. Now, when I'm reading this stuff, there's, I mean, I'm like Doc. I don't know how in the world anybody could ever believe in evolution and believe in the second law of thermodynamics, the law of entropy. It goes against, you know, we talk about things happening by accident. In a closed system, entropy is increased. It's just more disorder and randomness and more loss of energy, not gaining energy. How in the world could you believe in evolution? Yet they do. But that third law blew me away. That third law is actually describing the great deep that is frozen and is like a sea of glass, uh, like unto crystal. It's, it's a crystalline structure, and it's perfect. And that thing's above our head. But he says there, now that, there's a part of this I don't understand. The waters are hid as with a stone. Well, definitely it's hid. Science hasn't found it yet. I haven't, I haven't heard anything on the um, Science Channel or the History Channel or the, uh, I don't know, whatever channel it is. I haven't found anything that says that, hey, there's some water above our universe. Who knew that? <laughs> well, any Christian believe their Bible knew that. It's hidden from them. They can't see it. They can't detect it. They can't measure it. They don't even know it's there. And they're, ah, 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 to believe the Bible, ah, ah. Surely. Well, if God created the heaven and earth, he knows what's up there, wouldn't he? I certainly would know. And he says there's, there's a, a, an expanse of water up there, and where, where it is north, it's frozen. And if you want to know what, what, what his throne is sitting on, it's sitting on that frozen deep. See, how big is it? I don't know. It could be humongous. But there's a sea of glass up there. Have you ever been out on a, or have you ever looked out on a lake? Or sometimes it happens with my pond. Um, if you get a, a, a light breeze blowing through there, or it settles and gets real cold, you can't even tell. It, it, there's, it doesn't turn white. It's still blackish looking. Or um, you can't even tell there's ice on there. It's like black ice on the road. It is just so smooth and so flat. You can't even tell it's there. Um, I imagine that what, that's what heaven looks like. You get up there, man, it's like you're walking on glass. It's what he, he likens it to, a sea of glass. And if it's at zero degrees Kelvin, it's harder than any glass you've ever, you've ever seen. There's no movement in that thing, and there's no loss of energy in that thing. Everything below that, in our universe, is losing energy constantly, and God's not putting anything back. Why? It's done for. It's fallen. That's the reason why the earth is groaning. The Bible says in, in Romans 8, it groaneth and travaileth. Of course it is, because God's not putting any energy into this thing until He comes back. And in a millennium, He's going to reduce some, He's going to put some energy back into it. But until then, it's falling apart. Of course it is. But man thinks by controlling carbon dioxide, somehow we're going to save the planet? It's a joke. The only one that can save this planet is the one that created it in the first place. He's the one that can save the planet. And we only need to save it for another thousand years. So, Anyway, I don't know what that rock stands for or, or stone. The waters are hidden, are hid as with a stone. I know it's covered up. They can't see it. 
Maybe talk about like hide it under a rock. Anybody got any ideas what he might mean by stone? Hmm. Okay. The waters are hid as with a stone. He just got things in the way. Blocking view. Okay. Okay. All right, I'm going to stop there tonight. He said, when are we going to get through chapter 38? I'm thinking first of the year. <laughs> no, I think, hopefully in a couple more weeks. But I mean, it's like... All right, anybody got any ideas about that? You let me know. Any questions about tonight? I realize it's all over the place. I mean, God's...